Hi, my name is John Chase, and I'm going to be your host today for five things I wish someone told me when I started kayaking. So I put this presentation together with the intention of making sure that we had a, a basic set of, of information that every kayaker should be aware of in order to be happy, be safe, um, and make sure we're coming back to the family, well, safe and happy. Um, so we're going to focus on five different areas, just as the title suggests today, of information and knowledge for every paddler. And we're going to start with the boat. We're going to move from there into different gear. We're going to move from there into finding people to paddle with, making sure we're doing it right and, uh, and being efficient with it. And then we'll talk about some special considerations for, uh, for our sport because it is a water sport. When it comes down to it, we all started the same way. We all started from a point of not knowing what we don't know. And that's the intention with, uh, with today's agenda is to kind of shed some light on the things that we don't know that we don't know, give us the information and knowledge that we need in order to go find that at the Canoe Copia show, hopefully, and, uh, and then continue on from there and again, be safe and happy and be a, a talented paddler for many, many years to come. So with that, let's jump into the first one. We're gonna talk about the boats. And the first thing to think about, and the first thing to know is that all boats are not created equal. I can't just run down to Rutabaga and pick up any old boat and have it do whatever purpose that I'm trying to do. Um, it's like a bicycle or a car or anything else. Each boat has its specific purpose. So in order to dive into that, we are gonna to have to get into some really nerdy content here. So we're gonna get into some science type stuff and a tiny bit of math. You'll see an equation that'll show up a little bit later, but nothing too deep, nothing too detailed, but just know that we are gonna get into just a little bit of stuff here. So with that in mind, let's start with four different areas of boat design that will help you understand why a boat does what it does. Um, so the first of those being width. And the wider the boat generally, the more stable the boat, right? So, and the more narrower the boat, the more unstable or, uh, yeah, the more unstable that boat is. So width is a, is a, generally has a direct correlation to stability on your boats. Now that also has a downside and that is that a wider boat is going to tend to be slower than a narrower boat. So a narrower boat's gonna be faster, wider boat is gonna be slower. Our second component here is length. And a longer boat is generally going to be faster. A shorter boat is generally going to be slower. My longer boat as well is generally going to track better in a straight line. My short boat is generally going to want to turn a little bit more um, than that long boat. So third principle is height. Uh, a higher boat is going to have generally have more room in that boat. A narrower boat or a lower profile boat is generally going to be less room but it's also going to catch less wind, meaning that the higher that boat sits off the water, the more wind is caught by that boat um, as wind's coming at it. So there's advantages and disadvantages uh, to that. The fourth piece is what's called rocker with a boat. And a rocker is just as it sounds. If you think about a rocking, um, a rocking chair, well, a rocking chair comes up at the ends and allows that rocking chair to turn. Well, the same thing happens with a boat. When a boat has rocker to it, as you see in this particular picture, this boat curves up at the ends. So that makes it rock a little bit more. Now, why would you want it to do something like that? If I think about um, a boat like this one as an example, I see that there's a little rocker to this. It does curve up at the end of the bow, but it doesn't curve up much at the end at the stern. So that long boat with, with less rocker is going to tend to want to go in a straight line. It's not going to turn as well. Doesn't mean it's never going to turn, just not going to turn as well. And you need to modify the shape of that through how you maneuver the boat and how you move your body in order to make that boat uh, do what you want it to do. But that boat with less rocker is going to be, tend to be going in a straight line better. And the boat with more rocker is going to tend to turn better. So again, think about a rocking chair and how that, how that moves and how easy it would be to spin it because only a little bit of that rocker is actually sitting on the ground. Same thing happens with the boat. So width, length, height, and then the rocker are all components of boat designs. There's lots more that we can get into, but for the purpose of our time today, let's just focus on those width, length, height, and rocker. So another illustration of rocker here is that when that boat's in the water, you'll see the ends of that blue boat turning up and the ends of the orange boat going straight. All right, so that less rocker boat is going to be uh, straighter and going in more of a straight line. All right. So let's add one more component to this and let's talk parts of a wave. So a longer boat is going to span the crests of the wave. So you see a crest is the top of the wave. You have two tops of the wave in this picture. And then you have a trough 
where that wave goes down. Well, a longer boat is going to span across those wave, wave crests, assuming the wavelength is not longer than the boat. Um, either way, it's going to ride up and down less. So if you have a, a 17 foot boat, for example, and you've got a 10 foot wavelength, then that boat will generally span across that. But if you've got a 10 foot boat and a 10 foot wavelength, it's going to go up and down and up and down and up and down. And that's a lot harder to travel in a long distance. So um, a longer boat is going to span that wavelength a shorter boat is going to ride, ride those waves uh, more so. So let's get into talking about some different boats specifically and what we use those characteristics and apply those to these boats. So the first one we have here is what's called a recreational kayak. And a recreational kayak is just as it sounds. It's for recreational waterways, for easy um, ponds, rivers, uh, places you can easily walk off if you were to capsize, um, or places that the likelihood of capsize is pretty low. So this is something you're going to use on a very easy waterway. One of the nice things about the boat is that you, A, you've got its width. So recreational boats tend to be wider. And that width, as we talked about earlier, gives you more stability to your boat. Boat also tends to be shorter. You tend, tend to find most of these boats in the 9 to 11 or so foot, uh, foot length. And uh, when, you, when you have a boat of that length, you're tend to, gonna tend to find that that boat's going to turn more. So again, it goes back to that principle we were talking about earlier. Shorter boat's going to be a, a turn more. It's not going to track as well in a straight line. A longer boat is gonna track in a straight line. So here you've got a shorter, wider boat. It's gonna be a little bit easier to turn. And that width is going to give you some more stability. Some other advantages that you've got with a boat like this is if you're looking purely for comfort, you're gonna have a, probably a more comfortable seating system. You can have a higher back band or this back rest here. Um, as well, you're gonna have a larger, more open cockpit. So for those who are concerned about being feeling confined in a boat, that larger open cockpit might give some comfort level. Now, this particular boat, the Wilderness Systems Pungo, actually has this attachment that you can add on. And it's like a, I don't know, a deck pod or whatever you might call it. And you can add in, uh, there's spaces for drinks and a uh, place to put your phone and your snacks. And I think there's even a USB charging port on here. So there's uh, lots of unique features to this. So somebody who might be going out for uh, a day of photographing uh, wildlife, for example, could this may be an ideal platform that be for because of its stability and its ability to hold gear at your fingertips. Right. And then these deck bungees here are just used for lashing items down, like a water bottle and that sort of thing. Um, I'll talk about this little hatch here. This hatch basically allows a space to be able to store items in the back of the boat. But one thing to keep in mind is with recreational kayaks, it's basically a large open cavity here. So if you put something in the back here, it's not protected. It's not water protected. Um, so if water happens to get in here, that's going to flow in from the cockpit area into the back of the boat. So don't expect in a recreational kayak to have this water or have this hatch be watertight. Um, it's just a space to store stuff. So you need to make sure that you're waterproofing that stuff. So our second kind of boat that we'll take a look at is what's called a sit on top kayak. So in many cases also used for recreational purposes. Um, very, very big in the fishing market. You'll find a lot of fishing kayaks, actually the fastest growing segment of kayaking at the time. But the nice thing about a sit on top kayak, very easy to get in, very easy to get out. Um, it's for those who might be concerned about feeling confined inside a boat, while well, we saw that larger cockpit on the last boat, in this case, you're completely open. Um, so the advantage there, easy to get in, easy to get out. Uh, if you fall out, climb back on, you don't have to figure out how to get back inside the boat. Um, the disadvantage is that you're gonna be a lot wetter in a boat like this. Uh, all the water is gonna hit you as opposed to hitting the boat itself. Uh, for fishermen, like I was talking about earlier, you'll find very specific purpose built boats that will actually have rod holders built in along the sides. Um, it could have a live well in here. So this is just a little uh, storage component here, but you might have a live well built into the boat as well and lots of other features that uh, can really be beneficial for a fisherman. Our third boat that we're going to take a look at is called a whitewater boat. Um, and it's just as it sounds, this is a boat that's designed to be used in a whitewater environment. It's generally short. Um, you're tend going to tend to find that these are about the same length as those recreational boats that we saw earlier, but some differences with a boat like this particular one. 
So one thing that you notice right away is that rocker. So we were talking about rocker earlier. So you see the bow ends or the bow end curves up, the stern end curves up, and that gives you the ability to make quick turns. And that's exactly what we're looking for in a whitewater boat is that we want the ability to make those quick turns. So just as we were talking about rocker earlier, rockers are a whole lot more fun than a, than a you know, rockers with a, a curved legs are a whole lot more fun than rockers with flat legs. So we want to make sure that we're giving the opportunity to have a good time. And that's really what you're looking for in that whitewater boat is the opportunity to make those quick turns. Uh, that's what it's going to give you. All right. It's going to give you the benefits of a sit in boat as well by protecting you and giving you a space to put a, uh, a spray skirt on. And this particular boat also has a unique feature in that it's hatch in the back um, on uh, this particular boat, it's more of a hybrid or crossover boat. This is a Piranha boat, uh, Piranha Fusion. And uh, this particular one has this hatch in the back and this hatch is protected from the elements by putting a, a bulkhead wall in the back here. So if water comes into the cockpit area, it's stopped by this wall, making this stern end here watertight. Um, I didn't say waterproof. We'll talk a little bit about that later. The next kind of boat, we're gonna move up into kind of a touring class or a day touring class. And this is a Dagger Stratus here. Um, they make this particular boat in a 12 foot and a 14 foot length, which is generally what you're gonna find in this type of category. And so for this particular boat, you're starting to get the best of both worlds in terms of the best features of a sea kayak, the best features of a, um, um, you know, I guess I'll say a whitewater boat or even a, even a recreational boat. So some of the things that we'll take a look at here so you, again, you get the, the sit-in style boat. Right? Um, you've got more performance features in that you don't have that high back on that high seat back that would get in the way of some maneuvers. You'll see here that you've also got two hatches. So there's a hatch up in the front, hatch in the back. And on a boat like this, there is a bulkhead wall that is right here, right behind the seat. And then another bulkhead wall that's right in front of the feet. And what those bulkhead walls do is that if this boat were to capsize, the only thing that's going to fill up with water is the center section of the boat, this cockpit area of the boat, your stern end where your gear is stored and your bow end where your gear is stored are gonna stay secured um, and relatively dry. Again, water tight, but not necessarily waterproof. Um, this boat has a little bit of rocker to it. So it curves up a little bit, a little bit at the ends, just a little bit. Um, and you're also going to find that this particular boat actually has a skeg on the back. So that skeg is something that drops down and allows this boat to increase its tracking. So you have a shorter boat that might not track as well as a long boat, but then you add that skeg on there and it, and it adds to the tracking capabilities of that boat, giving it the ability to move, um, in a, um, to move forward a little bit better. All right. And then we move up into a sea kayak. And so we're looking at a Cetus MV by our friends at PH Sea Kayaks. And uh, the Cetus MV, as you see from what we talked about before, there's very little rocker to this. So you see a very straight, what's called a keel line. Uh, that bottom of the boat is the keel line. So a very straight boat, very low profile boat. It's also a relatively narrow boat at around 22 inches, uh, as, a, as opposed to 28 to 30 for that recreational boat. And then you've got those uh, dry hatches that we talked about on that last boat and the dagger. But this one, you see another hatch right here and another hatch right here. So let's talk a little bit, little bit about those. This particular one right behind the seat is called a day hatch. And what a day hatch is, is it's just as it sounds. I can't reach all the way to the back here or all the way to the front as I'm paddling, but I can rotate in my seat and I can get something out of here for the, from the day hatch. So things that I need at the ready are, are stored here. And I've got a bulkhead wall right here behind the seat, another bulkhead wall between that day hatch and their stern hatch. And then all the way up in the front here, just in front of the feet, I've got another bulkhead wall that protects the bow storage area. And this little, uh, uh, little hatch right here, this particular one on this particular boat um, is just a small storage area where you might want to put um, an energy bar or uh, an extra pair of gloves or something that you might use at the ready. And it's just right there, quick and available for you. So, so that is a, uh, we move up into the sea kayak. So we've taken a look at recreational boats, a recreational kayak, a sit on top, a whitewater boat, a touring boat, moving into a, uh, into a sea kayak. You also notice a different material here. So if we head back for a second, and we look at this, uh, this dagger, this dagger and the other boats we took a look at are plastic boats. And the advantage of a plastic boat, 
you can beat on it, jump on it. Um, you can do all sorts of things to this boat, knock it up against rocks, and very little is going to happen to it. That plastic boat is going to flex a lot more than, than other types of construction. When we get into something like the Cetus, now we're dealing with a, um, with a fiberglass boat. And so the advantage of a fiberglass boat is that you're going to increase the stiffness and therefore increase the efficiency of what you're doing. But you're also sacrificing a little bit in terms of its durability. Um, on the other hand, you can repair a fiberglass boat or a Kevlar boat or a carbon fiber boat a whole lot easier than you can repair a, um, a plastic boat. So there's pluses and minuses with each of those. Depending on what you're looking for, I encourage you to talk to the folks at Rutabaga, have them help you select the boat that meets your needs uh, and, and is intended for your particular purpose. Because like I mentioned earlier, each boat has a specific purpose in mind. So the budget doesn't end at the boat. So there's a few things we want to make sure we're touching on here um, in terms of equipment. And the first of those is your PFD. Um, I'm going to ask that everybody always, always, always wear your PFD. And for those that say, well, I don't wear my PFD because my PFD is not comfortable. Um, I'm going to ask that you find a comfortable PFD. Because once you find a comfortable PFD, you won't, you won't be reluctant to wear that PFD. And PFD, for those not familiar with it, um, that's personal flotation device. That's your life jacket. So each, again, each one, just like a boat, is designed for a different purpose. Um, there are women's specific designs. There are kayak uh, and canoe designs. There are um, surfing designs. Or sorry, not surfing. Um, what am I thinking of? Um, water skiing. There we go. Um, all, all sorts of different things are different PFD designs, but you want to make sure that you've got one that is purpose-built. It's designed for paddling. So this is a coca tap, um, guide here and a very nice nice PFD on uh, this particular one. My second recommendation is to buy the better paddle. So I, I get asked a question a lot about should I spend a little bit of extra money on a paddle or should I spend a little bit of extra money on a, um, on a PFD, uh, sorry, on a, on a boat. And my, my recommendation is always, if you're trying to figure out, do I spend an extra $100 on the paddle or do I spend an extra $100 on the, uh, on the boat? Uh, my money is always going to be on that paddle. Um, that good paddle, you're swinging that paddle a thousand times or more over the course of an hour. If you've got a, a heavy boat anchor of a paddle and you're trying to move that paddle um, over the course of your, your time on the water, you're, you're going to be tired pretty quickly. Whereas a lighter paddle is going to be more efficient for you and it's also going to perform better and quite frankly it's going to be more durable. It's going to last longer as well. So this particular one that I'm showing is a Werner Cypress. It's a carbon fiber paddle. So very light, very efficient, very thin blade. Um, the one here is a Werner Schuna, and uh, this particular one is a fiberglass paddle. So the difference between the two, your fiberglass is going to be a little bit heavier, but it's also going to be much more durable. Um, I would still ask that avoid from you know, getting in the boat and using your paddle as a pry and don't push off the beach or push off rocks with it. You really don't want to do that with any paddle, uh, but I wouldn't do that with either of these. But that said, my fiberglass paddle, if it happens to hit a rock or something like that in the river that I'm paddling on, it's, it's not going to sustain uh, damage, where that carbon fiber paddle is more likely to sustain some damage uh, as you're in an environment like that. So you're going to use something like this carbon fiber paddle in an environment where you're not going to be going up against rocks and, and other sorts of things. And that fiberglass paddle might be better suited uh, to that particular environment. So again, my money is always going to be on spend a little bit more money on the paddle rather than the boat. Third area is a communication device. So you want to make sure that you have at least one, if not more than one communication device um, on you at all times when you're on the water. The first of those that you always, always, always need to have by Coast Guard rule is that you need to make sure that you've got a whistle. Uh, so you got to have a whistle on your on your person somewhere. I carry mine in the, uh, in the pocket of my PFD. So there's a front pocket uh, right here. It's just behind my hand and I'll carry my, my PFD in there. Um, incidentally, I'll also carry an energy bar and a couple of other things that I might use uh, throughout the day as well, or that somebody else in my party might need throughout the day. For me, for communication devices, um, right on my, on my body, right here in my PFD, you'll see that I'm carrying a, a VHF radio. So I'll often carry that VHF radio, and then I'll also carry a cell phone in my, uh, in my hatch. So I don't necessarily need to have the cell phone at the ready, but that'll be available for me should I need it. Now, why do I carry both? I don't know what reception I'm going to have, and I'm not. It depends on what area I'm going to be in. So, if I'm in an area without cell reception, my VHF radio might be might be just the trick for me. All right. 
Um, now, since I've got electronics on board, I want to waterproof those electronics. And there's a couple of different opportunities to do that. So um, one is just a simple case. So you see a seal line case here. It's a, this is a floating case. Uh, oops, go back here. This does have this little bar here on the side. Uh, it's actually a, a piece of flotation. So if this case were to drop into the water, it's going to float with this side up. Um, and there's a waterproof seal on there. So I'm, I'm good to go with that particular one. What I would avoid is, and I see this a lot, is I see folks who take a, um, a plastic baggie, like a Ziploc baggie, and they put their phone in that Ziploc baggie, and they think, oh, my, I'm all safe, I'm secure, everything's going to be good. And if they happen to drop that over the side, their phone may be secure, but it will be safe and dry at the bottom of whatever body of water that they're in because there's no flotation with that plastic baggie. So I want to make sure you've got some fl flotation with whatever you're, uh, whatever you're uh, securing your item in. Now, Flotation and uh, uh, waterproofing doesn't go just for your phone. You want to make sure that the rest of the gear that you have with you is also waterproof. So I'll give you some examples of some other things that you might find at the, uh, at the Canoe Copia show here. These are dry bags. So each of these uh, bags is a, is a coated, generally coated nylon bag. Some of them are a, a plastic bag, like really, really heavy plastic. And it's got a roll top closure with a, um, with a buckle closure as well. So I'll put all my gear in there. And I use multiple sizes of those, roll that up, lock it in place, put that inside my boat. And then there's a little bit of air in there along with the rest of your gear. Um, so if that happens to go over, it's going to float uh, because of the air that's in it. So I would highly encourage have a dry bag and then also have a way to make sure you're securing your other valuables um, that are with you. <clears throat> the last piece of the budget doesn't end at the boat is the right clothing for your, for your environment. And we'll talk a little bit more about clothing a little bit later. But the point with this whole section is that you can't just go out and buy a boat and say that I'm done with that. We need some other gear to in order to make sure that this is a, is a happy endeavor. So you need to make sure you've got a good, comfortable PFD that you're going to wear, um, a solid paddle that's going to get you through and get you back, a communication device if things don't go well, a way to waterproof all those, and then the right equipment, the right clothing that we'll talk about in a little while. My third point is to count on your community. Um, we all have a community that makes a difference for us, and, and paddling is no exception to that. There are many, many great uh, local paddling clubs. I've listed a couple here, so the Mad City Paddlers up in Madison, Prairie State Canoeists in the Chicago area, and then Northeast Wisconsin Paddlers up in the uh, Green Bay area. And each of these clubs, as well as clubs wherever you might be located, um, will you know, basically be full of, of like-minded people who are interested in paddling, interested in bringing you into their environment as well, and sharing knowledge about the local community, about where to paddle, where to put in, where to take out, um, and, and all sorts of good things. So I would just highly encourage you to connect with your local club, volunteer back to your local club, make a difference with that. The more you put in, the more you'll get out of it. Now, another community um, that is a near and dear to my heart personally, and not to make this sound like too much of a, um, of a commercial for Canoe Copia, but the Door County Sea Kayak Symposium um, is a great event that Canoe Copia, sorry, that uh, Rutabaga runs every year. It's uh, in July at beautiful Raleigh's Bay Resort up on the Door Peninsula on the Lake Michigan side. And it is truly just a weekend of adult summer camp. Um, great instructors. Um, of course, I'm a little bit biased with that, but a great instructor team. And it's certainly one of my favorite weekends of the year. And I would highly encourage anybody to take an opportunity, spend a couple of days um, and, and go up there and just really immerse yourself in the experience. Um, ultimately, what a community does for you is it allows you the opportunity to paddle with paddlers who are more skilled with you, more skilled than you. And what that's going to do is that's going to make you a better paddler. Um, the more you, you glean from them and, and paddlers in your local clubs, they want to share their knowledge. They want to share information. That's why they're there. That's why they're part of the club. Um, somebody did that for them at one time, and they're going, to, they're going to pay it forward and do the same thing for you. So take the opportunity, participate in your local club, find communities that you can count on. On a bonus side, um, what you're always going to have is you're always going to have a ride back. Um, I used to run a kayak livery, and I, I can't tell you how many times people would say, well, I'll just I'm going to go down river and then I'll just paddle back up, right? Uh, it doesn't really work that way. It's not Mr. Toad's wild ride at Disney World. It doesn't go in a circle. You can't just come right back. Um, and the current may be strong enough that you aren't just paddling up river. So you got to make sure we've got opportunities to, to get back. Now, for those rare circumstances when you might not have a, a large population of people, you know, a big community that you can count on, or you're uh, only out with yourself and another friend, for example, 
Um, and, and a method that I've used is to use Uber or use a bike. So you can start at your put in, unload your boat. Um, all right, actually, I'll change that a little bit. You know, maybe you go to your takeout, you drop a bike at the takeout, you lock that to a tree, you drive up to your put in location, put your boat in the water, paddle down river to your bike, switch the locks, lock your boat up to the tree, take your bike, ride that back up to your car, get your car and bring it back down to your boat. So you've got an exercise both ways. You've had an opportunity to combine a paddle trip and a bike trip together. Um, you can reverse that. You can do it different ways. Um, you could get down to your takeout area, lock your boat up, schedule an Uber, have Uber come pick you up, drive you back up to your, uh, to your put-in location as well. So you've got, got different opportunities, but certainly by far it's easier to rely on a community that you can trust rather than uh, rely on one of those other circumstances. So my next piece of advice is walk, crawl, run. Um, again, as an instructor, I hear many times where somebody will, one of their first times in a boat is, okay, what I wanna do is I wanna learn how to roll. Well, let's, let's, you know, we're, we're going right to run. So let's make sure we're learning how to walk, how to crawl and how to run. And we do that by focusing on the fundamentals first. We learn the things that we need to learn in order to be effective and efficient uh, on the water. And then we build our skills from there to those more advanced skills. So focus on fundamentals first, learn the right things. Um, the internet may not always be correct. There's lots of advice out there. There's thousands and thousands of YouTube videos um, out there on how to paddle and how to do this and how to rescue and all sorts of things, but they may or may not be the right things. So I would encourage you to make sure you're, when you're uh, looking at, at videos on the internet, look at those with a critical eye, make sure that you have an understanding of who it is that's producing the video and what the experience level is of that particular person. And then also look at the age of the video. Um, there's a lot of videos out there and I've put some out as well that are old and techniques have changed. Um, so we as a community have a responsibility to be taking those videos down as that technique goes out of date and then uh, putting new ones up. So, you know, make sure you're, you're using something that's relatively recent and not, uh, not a really old video. The third of those walk, crawl, run um, is to find an ACA instructor, ACA being the American Canoe Association. Um, they've got a great website with, with a lot of information on it. You can go to the ACA's website um, and, and then search, do the instructor search option and it'll allow you to put in information to find instructors in your particular area in the discipline that you're interested in and uh, names and email addresses and everything will pop up so you can contact them and, and uh, get it done right. So, and those of you who are in the Madison area or relatively close to the Madison area, um, Rutabaga of course has a great instructional program and they run programs out of the Rutabaga shop and as well locally um, all the time. So uh, good opportunities there. So, Building on the walk, crawl, run, I'm going to give you a couple of pieces of advice that will help you be a more efficient paddler. And the first of those is to use the whole body. And when I say use the whole body, I mean start right from the top, all right? Start right at the head. The, the most important um, piece of, uh, well, the most important thing we have is our brain in terms of paddling. It's not our arms, it's not you know, the upper body, the lower body, it's the brain. Yeah, it's the brain that's going to tell us what to do when to do it, when we're doing something dumb, when we're doing something right. And you know when you're doing something that's just not quite right. Um, you feel it in your gut, you feel it in your head, and your head's telling you, you shouldn't be doing this. So if you shouldn't be doing it, if your head's telling you that, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. So use your head first. Um, it also is a, is a great device to be able to tell us what's going on in the area. Um, it'll allow us to be able to look up and say, what's happening with the weather? Should I be going out now or should I be coming back now? So. Use the whole body, start with the head, move down. Um, as I move down, um, this particular picture, the person here in the picture is practicing what we call good torso rotation. So a way to be very efficient in, the, in, the, uh, in your paddling stroke is to move that upper body, all right? Um, if I'm just windmilling along with the arms, those arms are awfully small muscles for most people, uh, myself included. So I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be pretty tired if I'm just using my arms, just using my shoulders, but I wanna use the entire core musculature. I wanna use that middle section of the body. And if I get that whole middle section of the body moving and involved in the exercise, involved in the activity, I'm gonna be a whole lot more efficient, whole lot more effective, and I'm gonna be um, able to paddle a lot longer and be able to enjoy it more. My second piece of advice is to grip lightly. Um, you'll see the person in the picture here has a very light grip on the paddle. Um, almost barely holding it here with the top hand, barely holding it with the low hand. I really don't need to have a lot of grip with that paddle. In fact, 
uh, I give you a good piece of advice here, and that is think about holding eggs when you're paddling, or you know, think about holding a pair, uh, holding some eggs in your hands. If if you're holding onto those eggs, you want to hold them tight enough that you don't drop the eggs, but loose enough that you don't crush or crack the eggs. So think about that when you're when you're paddling as well. That's about the grip that you should have on your paddle shaft. No tighter. Doesn't need to be any any tighter. All right. Third one is loose hips save ships. And I'm going to use an example from another sport here, skiing. And if you've ever watched a good skier, you'll see that that, that person's upper body doesn't move much at all. So their upper body stays in that same vertical position and their lower body is moving to meet the challenges that, that it arrives at. All right, so in this person, in this case, the person's hitting moguls, um, their lower body is adjusting to compensate for that while the upper body is staying in the same position. Well, your boat and paddling works the same way. We wanna let that boat flow underneath us. We wanna let the boat move underneath you and let your body adjust to the water as opposed to fighting the water especially men. Uh, we as men, we tend to be top heavy. We tend to be really, um, really tense in a boat. Loosen up. Pretend that you've just gone to a Zumba class. Relax. Let that lower body move a little bit because loose hips will save ships. The fourth piece of advice, listen to your mother. So mom always said, have good posture. And we want to make sure that we're doing that in a boat as, uh, as well as anywhere else that we happen to be. So sitting upright, sitting nice and tall, um, is going to give you much more power and much more efficient, efficiency with the boat. If you imagine you're sitting at home and you're in a recliner, you can't generate much, much power in that recliner. But when you're sitting upright, you're strong, you're ready, you're braced. And the same thing happens in a boat. If I'm reclined and I'm leaning way back in my boat and just chilling out on the water, I may want to do that, but I can't expect to get a lot of power out of that. So if I want to have power, have efficiency, uh, I want to sit upright, I want to listen to my mother and have good posture. The last part of those is rescue you, rescue me. So please make sure that you, you know how to get yourself out of the water. And as an added bonus, make sure you know how to get other people out of the water as well. Um, nobody plans to capsize, but in the event that we do capsize, we want to make sure that we get out of the water and we get out of the water safely. Uh, and, and we have a responsibility as paddlers to help those around us as well. So the person in the picture here is performing what's called a, called a paddle float rescue. So they're using this inflatable float They've put that on the end of their paddle blade, and then they're using their paddle blade, or their, you know, their paddle shaft and the paddle blade is basically a giant kickstand. Um, so this is floating, they've climbed back up on that paddle shaft. Uh, this person's bringing, bringing his legs back into the boat, and then he'll end up maneuvering uh, back inside the boat, all, use, all while using this paddle float as a, uh, as a rescue aid. Now the next people here, You've got somebody doing what's called a T rescue, um, where they are helping each other get back in the boat. So the person in the the blue uh, blue paddling jacket is helping the person in the orange paddling jacket get back into the boat. So it's called a T rescue or an assisted rescue. This is one definitely I would encourage you to learn as well, uh, because you never know if you're going to be the one in the water. The more you know, the easier it is for you to be able to get out. All right. The last of these principles is it is a water sport and you will be wet always. Um, there's, no, there's really very little exception to that. So my first piece of advice here is to always bring a change of clothes. Um, as soon as you get out of the water, you're gonna have what's called convective and conductive cooling. Or sorry, you're gonna have con convective cooling when you're outside, uh, get outside the water. So imagine yourself on a nice warm day, it's 75 degrees, uh, but you've been in the, in the boat for a while and you've worked up a sweat and uh, you've got some water on you from well, being wet because it is a water sport. So as soon as you get out, you've got a little bit of a breeze blowing on you, and that breeze is going to cool you down very, very quickly. So if you bring that change of clothes, and the first thing you do before you pack your gear up and put your boat away and all that sort of stuff is to immediately get out of the wet clothes, get into the dry clothes, um, then you're going to avoid that convective cooling. So convective being air moving across the cold body or the cold, wet body is going to cool you down. Um, conductive cooling is a little bit different. And conductive cooling is when you're in the water, physically in the water, that water is going to suck the heat away from your body four to five times faster than you if you were outside the water. So we want to watch for conductive cooling where the, well, the water is a conductor drawing the heat away from the body. So to do that, we always, always, always dress for the water temperature, not the air temperature. That's not relevant. It's the water temperature. Always expect to be in the water at some point and, and dress for that water temperature. So the pieces of clothing that I'm showing here um, are just two pieces of uh, very light, they call them hydroskin. This is uh, NRS is the maker of these. 
And so these hydroskins are very, very thin neoprene, anywhere from usually a half to one millimeter uh, neoprene. So this is for a cooler day. Um, and this is generally something that's a little bit cooler, but you're you know, not likely to be in the water, but likely to be wet. Uh, and basically what a wetsuit does, which is what neoprene is, and then these are effectively wetsuit material, um, is a wetsuit is actually designed to keep you wet. I know it's kind of an oxymoron, but it's actually designed to be wet. And then it traps a thin, thin, thin layer of water between your body and the suit itself. And your body heat warms up that thin layer of water. So that's what's happening here with this two-piece suit. You've got a, a, a hydroskin top and a hydroskin bottom. Um, and next one here, you move up into a wetsuit. So this is a full one-piece deal. This is called a farmer, actually a farmer brown, I think this one is. And uh, there's farmer brown and farmer john, but this is a farmer brown. And uh, this particular one, um, is a heavier one. So this is a three millimeter wetsuit. And this is, again, this is kind of going a step up from those hydro skin. There you have a half to one millimeter. You go to two to three, all the way up to seven or so millimeter. The heavier the millimeters, the colder the water generally. Um, so now in terms of which one is right for you, it depends on a number of factors. It depends on how cold the water is, how cold your body runs or how hot your body runs how long you might expect to be in the water, any number of different things. But um, the kind of the rule of thumb is expect to be in the water and dress appropriately to be able to, ex to spend an extended time in the water. All right, so whatever weight of gear it takes in order for you to be comfortable while you're in the water, waiting for a rescue, trying to get out, you know, whatever the case may be, uh, but dress for the water temperature and expect to be in it. As we move uh, a different step here, this is a splash jacket. Um, so a splash jacket is something that's designed to be used along with a wetsuit, for example. And uh, what a splash jacket does is, it's, is, just as it sounds, it's keeping water off you. So it's shedding water. Um, so this is just an outer layer, a wind layer. It is not a piece of dry wear, meaning that it's not going to keep you completely wet. It's just going to keep the, the ancillary water off you, um, stuff that's splashing on you and keep you a little bit, little bit drier and a little warmer. So I might wear with this along with some of the other gear that we've, uh, we've shown already. And what you're going to find here is that you've got Velcro uh, gathers on the cuffs, Velcro gather around the neck, and then there's a Velcro piece uh, along here as well. You can cinch the waist up so it'll keep some water out, but not necessarily all the water. Now, if I want to go to that level and start to keep all the water out, I'm going to go to the basically the top level here, and I'm going to end up with dry wear. And so this level six dry wear here, um, what you find here is that at the cuffs and at the, uh, at the neck, as well as on the full dry suit here at the cuffs and the neck, you've got a, um, a latex gasket. So that latex gasket basically fits and seals water from the neck, seals water out from the wrists, and, um, and basically keeps everything out. So this is not warm, meaning that it, it's not something that's intended to keep you warm, it's just intended to keep you dry. So uh, you wouldn't just be able to wear this in a pair of shorts on a, on a freezing cold day, you'd wanna wear this and some other base layers that are designed to keep you warm under this, but this will keep the water off you. Um, and there's two different designs here. So you're seeing a dry top and a pair of dry pants and then a full dry suit. Advantage of the dry top and the dry pants is that you can mix and match those. You can wear them at different times, uh, depending on what you need them. And um, they may be a little bit cooler as well. Um, they may, and they're a little bit easier to, to maneuver, to manage. The downside is that if you are, if there's a decent chance you're gonna be in the water, then once you uh, wet exit from your boat, for example, and you're only wearing a dry top, then your lower body is, is a little bit more exposed. Um, so you're still at risk, whereas with the, the dry suit, you're, you're taking much of that risk away uh, because you aren't relying on two pieces of gear. So good, better um, in, terms of, in terms of the two options. All right. So in terms of uh, Water temperatures. Let's talk a little bit, little bit about water temperatures with some information here that we've got from coldwatersafety.org. From this is from uh, the National Center for Cold Water Safety, and some interesting things about these temperatures and what our perceptions of temperatures are. So, water temperature at 90 to 100 feels 90 to 100 feels warm. Feels nice in the 80 to 90 range, but when we once we start getting down to 80, the water feels pretty cool. Um, you think about most commercial swimming pools that you go into. Most pools are set anywhere from 82 to 84 degrees. Um, at that lower end, at 82 degrees, people are starting to shiver. Um, if you think about it, that's 16 degrees below your normal body temperature. 
So you're going to, you're going to start to chill pretty quickly. Um, below 80, you start to get into those mid seventies, your breathing starts to get affected. And then once you get down to about the 70 degree level, you start getting, uh, start getting dangerous and very dangerous at the 60 degree level. So there are some, um, some rules that kind of float around out there in the, um, in the paddling world, and you'll see these. And one is the rule of uh, rule of 120 or rule of 100. Uh, I've seen it both ways, but essentially what that rule is saying is, as if the water temperature and air temperature, if you combine the two of those together, and it, it doesn't ex or it exceeds that number, then you're okay. You don't need uh, thermal protection. But that is actually a complete load of garbage um, because imagine that you've got that first warm day in April. It's 75 degrees, it's sunny, people start to break out the t-shirts and the shorts and the flip-flops. And yes, on that first 70 degree day, they start to break out the boats as well. And they go to the local waterway and they go out and they are having a good time and they end up capsizing. And they're not thinking about the fact that the water is still 40 or 50 degrees because it's just that very first 70 degree day. Well, you're going from 70 degrees to 40 degrees creates that cold shock. Um, you're in very dangerous water and your body doesn't know how to handle it. So it handles it by essentially going into cold shock and causing you to gasp. And when you're underwater and you suck in a lot of water, that can have very disastrous consequences. So um, if you ever see the rule of 100 or the rule of 20, rule of 120, completely ignore those. And I'm gonna ask that you always, always, always dress for the water temperature. Um, dressed for immersion, plan to be in the water, make sure that you're, you're staying safe. Above all, most importantly, it's people over boats. So what I mean by that is that um, always make sure that we're valuing people, always make sure that we're paying attention to the people that are with us, um, whether that's yourself or anybody else. We're not worrying about our, our boats. We're not worrying about our gear. Um, it's people are greater than boats. So uh, again, this is another one that I see quite often. I'll see someone who has just capsized and the first thing that they're worried about is they're worried about their 28 cent um, Walmart water bottle. Um, I'm not really concerned about your water bottle. I'm concerned about getting you out and making sure that you're safe. Um, not concerned about the rest of your gear as much as I am about getting you back into your boat safe and dry. We'll worry about the gear, the stuff that's floating away, um, you know, your lunch bag or whatever else. We'll get that stuff later. I want to make sure that I'm getting you. So long story short, let's focus on the right stuff. Let's focus on the people, not focus on the boats. Make sure that the people can come back safely. Boats are gear. We can always uh, find those again. So with that, we've gone through five different areas, talked about the right boat for the right conditions um, and did some nerdy stuff, talked a little bit about that. We went beyond the boat and talked about the budget not ending at the boat and some of the things that we need to make sure that we've got, um, how to count on our community and how to find a local community, um, some basics of walk, crawl, run. So making sure that we've got the fundamental skills before we go to the advanced level uh, and making sure we're looking for things the right way, seek out an ACA instructor, look for positive influences in your life, paddle with people better than you, um, and you'll learn more. And then the final part, it's a water sport. Know that we're going to be wet. We're always going to be wet. Um, dress for immersion, dress to be in the water, and, uh, and let's come back safe and happy. So with that in mind, I've got some great resources that are available for you for this uh, presentation, as well as some of the other pre presentations that you'll see me giving here at Canucopia. If you go to paddlingexercises.com slash Canucopia, um, you'll find that information. And while you're at paddlingexercises.com, shameless self-promotion here. Um, I do have a book, it's Power to the Paddle, Exercises to Improve Your Canoe and Kayak Paddling. You'll also find that at paddlingexercises.com along with the companion DVD um, to help you become a better, stronger, more efficient paddler. And then one other resource for you, um, this is paddlingtheblue.com. It is a kayak podcast and through this podcast, I take the opportunity to share the stories of people doing fantastic things from the seat of a boat. So if you enjoy stories about paddling and about wonderful places all around the world, this is the podcast for you. So I encourage you to give it a listen and appreciate you spending time with me today going through um, five things every paddler should know. So I've got some uh, contact information here, my email address, the two websites that I just mentioned. So please feel free to write those down. Um, you can also contact me uh, through the Whova app here that we're using for Canoe Copia. And I'll be happy to answer any questions on that. So thanks for your time today. I appreciate you joining me.